Hello, everybody. Um, uh, our next speaker is, uh, is the director of the Mississippi Tennis Academy at Barron uh, Bridges Tennis Center. He is the head coach for Mississippi's USTA Training Center and a coach at the Southern Town and Navigation Camps. He's got over 20 years of coaching, training, teaching, and speaking experience. He has been recognized as pro leader by the from the USTA and the USPTA. He's an expert in biomechanics using Darfish. Mr. Julio Gaudreau. Thank you. Thanks for coming and being here. Um, it's an honor. I already shared with Jack earlier today that about 25 plus years ago, I went to my first year's Mutate Convention in Palm Springs in California. And I remember seeing those guys walking around with their badges with all these little tags underneath them. And I finally realized they were special people. And 20 something years later, I finally got one of those badges with a little thing underneath it. And it's pretty cool. Um, I'll go through it real fast here. We have a lot of stuff to cover. Um, let's get started. Uh, the future. More like you either. Everyone in my facility working under one umbrella 
with one common goal and one common objective instead of everybody kind of doing their own thing. Too often, I talked to Richard this morning, too often at facilities, uh, as directors, we hire young pros and we specialize in working with the older kids and we give our younger kids to those young pros. And by the time they get to us, we'd like to have something in place, but we fail to communicate to those younger pros exactly what is it that I want from you. That can only be done if you come up with a system, if you take the time to come up with your own way, your own technical philosophy and beliefs that you're going to follow. What I did was, I looked at the top four male players in the world, I looked at Djokovic, Nadal, Murray, and Federer, and based on those four, I came up with what I call the commonalities of their stroke or mechanics or the things that they have in common. And then I went to all my staff and I said, here's what we're going to do here. So we're going to teach a forehand, a backhand, a serve, volleys, transition. And I came up with a whole philosophy of development and teaching. I'm going to share with you in very much detail the forehand one. If you look at Nadal and Djokovic, they look very different when they're playing a regular speed. But look amazingly how similar they start looking here when you watch them in slow motion. Same thing as Federer on the left and then Murray on the right. And you start looking and they have their own little things, but there's things that we find in common in both of them. One of the things now in slow motion, if I can show you in still frames, that we have in common. What we call our step one in our process, it's pretty much a turn of the shoulders and the hips and a lift of the hands. If you watch them play live, if you watch them play carefully, when they go to take the racket back, shoulders and hips turn, and all they do with their hands is they come up. And they come up to create separation between the elbow and the body because they want separation between the elbow and the body of the movement of hand. Our step two, it's a separation of the arms. So on step one, they come up, hands are together. On step two, the arms separate. This hand pretty much lines up with the front shoulder and is extended, and the racket hand, the one, the dominant hand, is extended behind them. Don't deviate on the angle and position in which they put the hand, but they pretty much, the location of the hand regards to their anatomy is in the same location. Our step three, I'm going to divide it in two, and we teach our pros that the step three has two parts. The first part is the downswing, because they go from going up, it comes down below ball level before it addresses the ball, and the butt cap gets exposed to the ball, the incoming ball that they're going to make impact with. Then we have step 3B, which is the moment of impact. We want them leading in with the butt cap so we're completely square with the ball at impact, and we have the racket face looking at the other side of the court. Step 4, it's actually one step that we teach, but it has also two parts. 4A is what I call the most important part, which is an inner rotation of the forearm. If you simply tell the player that they need to make impact on the ball and finish above the shoulder, common sense tells them to do this and then go to the shoulder. What they're actually doing is they're not flexing the forearm, they're rotating the forearm internally and the racket face stays looking at the other side of the court. And that's what we have right there in that position. And you can look at it, I mean, they're extremely similar and you would think that they're so different when you see them in the street plan. And the end of it, is they finish somewhere across the body. And if you never watch Nadal in slow motion, you'll think that Nadal goes from the impact and goes right into here. No, Nadal, Federer, Djokovic, they all pretty much going to go straight out. They come to here, and from here on is that they deviate on their own individual finishing points. If you look at Nadal right there, you can tell Nadal went through here, and then once he got here is that he's choosing to do this and go behind his head. Those are our four steps for the technique of the forehand. Now I want you to see how we transfer those into our players. On the left, you have Sophie who is six. On the right, you have Lantern who is seven. And what you're going to see now is that is step one, that is step two, that's step three, and that's step four. And years ago, I used to go, I started looking into martial arts. In martial arts, it's all about you being able to do the movements. You actually, I don't know how many of you are familiar, but you move from one class to another class based on the quality of your technique. If you think about it, if you're all players, how often have you, I remember years ago I said, I heard John McEnroe say that the way he identified a tennis player 
was the guy that was walking down the grocery store to pick up his stuff, and he saw him going back into it. And you think about it, you have your own individual feel. You know what your hands are supposed to be doing and the relation the hands have to the racket. Well, my idea was if I cannot get the players to do this on a step process, simply breaking it down, they won't be able to do it once we add on a ball and then we add on speed. So I came up with this four-step process to a forehand. Now you have Lampton on the left, who's a 10-year-old, and Alex on the right, who's an 8-year-old. And the same thing, there's step one, step two, step three, and step four. If you look at them, step three, we start asking them to release. So when they get to the end of step three and they're making impact, that foot is in that position, which means hips have come around and they're getting the feel of what's wrong because often we get players that step across with the front foot and they break the plane on the back foot. And if they do that wrong, when we ask them to do step three, they can't do it correctly and then they, can, they have to make the correction and fix it. Last one you have is Layla on the left, who's currently 12, but Layla started with orange ball. And Mathis, who is 10 and was your Southern Close champion this past year, only dropped two games. And you have step one, step two, step three, and step four. And you're going to, you could say to me, well, all those kids are doing close dances. I don't know if we noticed it earlier when I showed you uh, Federer and Murray. Murray was actually doing an open stance, Murray was doing a close dance. And what happens is that what we do on an open or a close stance from the waist up, it's identical. From the waist down, it varies based on the we set up. And my idea is, my personal belief is the open stance is an evolution of a close stance. So I'm going to teach a close stance. I want them to get a close stance. Or I don't know how many of you guys will think about it as a neutral stance. But what we're looking for is feet to be in the same plane and the front foot to be at 45 degree angle so it will allow the hips to rotate. And that's what I'm going to refer to as a close dance. The next one is actually when you can see them getting some balls from a side view. So you're going to see here, this is Sophie who is six. Step one, step two, and those are three and four. That's Lampton. Step one, two, three, and four. You see Lampton is tall and a little bit lanky. And you see the front arm drops a little bit early. This is Matthew who just turned eight. Matthew is smaller and more compact than Lampton, so you see his movement is a lot better. Alex just turned eight. Who notices something weird with Alex? Got a hitch. We got a bit of a hitch. We have a western grip. Yes. So, and did you notice also his point of contact is about shoulder height? Yes. So, a, a lot of you, I know that you're getting about this 10 and under format, and you're hearing that it's ideal because they're not going to get Western grips. Look for it, and still do it. They'll find a way to do it. That kid's been with us on the, the same system, and we have to fight with him about two things. One is the fact that he likes to take that ball higher, so he rolls over. Although I would add, he does a lot of 10 and under play with us, and on his own, he likes to play with what he calls regular balls where the other ones are pretty much strictly just playing with orange balls. So I am sure that that's played an impact into the fact that he rotates right over and he starts catching the ball higher. This is Lampton. That's your 10-year-old. And Lampton's actually quite big physically for 10. And if you look at it, it's, everything is pretty clean. And this is Matt. This was also, this is a 2, 10 and a half year old And that's your 12-year-old. And if you found, I mean, I just showed you, I think it's either six or eight of them. And technically, you're seeing almost the same foundation in about all of them. You see where they all kind of evolve from one age to the next. But we're not teaching, we're not going into saying to a six-year-old, here are all of your limitations, here's the only thing you can do because you're only six. I started experimenting with that one when she was five. And right now, by the time she's six, what she's given me from a technical perspective, it's pretty similar to what I'm seeing at a very good 12. Layla right now, it's about 11 or 12 in the south, and the girl's 12. Still has about six months to go. Um, and she's considered by the USDA, because they use it for level one national camps, 
to be a very talented and promising player for the U.S. Um, next one is the back end. We have the same thing for the back end. We have the four steps in the back end. I'm not going to go into as much detail on them on the back end, but I'm going to let you kind of see it. When I start playing the next screen now, you're going to see Nadal will be on your left and Andy Murray will be on your right on the screen and you'll see it in slow motion. And again, everything that I've come up with is not my own opinion of here's how they're going to do it. I started what the top, top players are doing and based on what the top players are doing, I came up with these parameters that I'm following on the technique we're going to teach. Developed another program 
We got him about 10 months ago. He used to step across. He used to do all kinds of disengagement between lower body and upper body, and we've been fixing it. The next one you're going to see is Alex. It's a little boy with a western grip that I told you that goes back between the two, the regular ball and the orange ball. And you're going to see that there's a stepping across on the back end, and there's a very strong grip on the back and side. And you can see the back leg, it's locked. Now that's a deficiency. And this is the 10 year old, this is Lanta. We've had him now for about two years. That stepping across, please be very careful. Um, I, I, if there's someone here from USDA National, don't get mad at me, it's my own opinion, it's not anything against you. Um, but you look at the top American players that we have on tour right now, and I'll bring one up, Jack Stock. I was at the Open and watched Jack when he lost his match to Tipsarevich. And no, Jack steps across about 45 degrees between his front foot and his back foot. When he sets up to get a back end, I don't know if you understand what I mean, but he sets up to get a back end, this leg is crossing the path of that leg, and he's at about 45 degrees. Tipsarevich, as much as he could, is here, or even a little bit here. All these steps across if there's no other option to get to a ball. Does, does, does that have an impact? I personally think it does. The fact, every time you step across, you're going to make your point of contact zone, the area where your racket is on the ball without deviation, smaller. The faster the ball starts coming in, the less accurate you're going to be on your guess of what you think the racket and the ball are going to be. You all know that's a guess, right? We don't see the racket and the ball meet. We estimate in an area where they're possibly going to meet. And if you watch the pros earlier in slow motion, the top players in the world, they almost go through that area without deviation. So if they're hitting a forehead, don't make impact, and you see an area where that racket didn't move at all. And then this one it leads. The more mechanical deficiencies you have, the less time you spend on that area. So the more demanding your game gets. And if you're thinking, that at six, seven, eight years old, it doesn't really matter what they do, it's all about getting them to like and fall in love with the game. I got news for you. That's pre-puberty. Pre-puberty is when you're going to put everything in place. That girl Layla, it's already past puberty. I pretty much have what I want to have for the rest of her career. I'll be able to change it and modify it, but a lot more difficult for her to make technical and mechanical changes than if I would have already had it in place when she got to 12. The serve. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, could you clarify that leaning in the backhand when you were talking? Did you say you didn't like them leaning into it? I don't like them leaning. What side of my, what side of my body hits a backhand? My dominant or non dominant? If it's a two handed, non dominant. Non -dominant. So if I start a shot, with this, which side is addressing the ball, my dominant or non-dominant? Oh, okay. The idea on that to have the back end is I'm going to bring all this stuff from back here forward. This is where the meat is. <coughs> this is a waste of time that's getting my shoulders to point down. But there is some sort of lean at point of contact, right? I wouldn't say a point of contact, I say a three contact. <coughs> so we have our step one, which is shoulder turn and racket. Our step two, which is your load, uh -huh. okay? and our step three, which is right there. That's it. That's all the lead I'm going to give you. And now this is shooting. This is coming through. That makes sense? Yeah. I guess that I, I just took it that when you were saying that you didn't like the lead. There's still a little lead yes. coming. Like here's what I don't like. Here's what I don't like. I'll show you exactly what I don't like. Okay, they, I don't like this at all. I'm empty. I'm everything, all my, all my body force against the ground that I've created is actually going at about 30 degrees downwards towards the ground. Now I'm going to have to do something funky here with my hands because my body's taking the ball down into the net, but my hands are going to have to get it over the net. One more thing that I'm very big on that I didn't say and I, I forgot to mention, the grip change on the back end. Okay? We still get too many players that are hitting back and where the dominant hand is not shifting over. Yeah. And that's what we call, I call it, open face and take back. Yeah. And if one of your kids play one of my kids, your kid better be really good. 
because my kid's going to hit early to the kid's forehand, move him over, and then try to go high handed to the back end because this back end has a limitation on how high of a ball they can handle, and they're either going to hit short balls or they're going to hit errors on that. How do I solve that? Well, my take back here, if you watch the best one that I think does it most for analysis is Nadal. Yeah. You'll clearly see that from Nadal. Serve. We also have steps to a serve. Okay? When I pull it up now, on the left of the screen, you're going to see Federer. Am I in your way again? I'm sorry. Um, on the left of the screen, you're going to see Federer. On the right, you're going to see Mathis Bilber, who's a 10 and a half year old. And I just want you to see um, how demanding are we on a serve when a 10 year old? <coughs> Does he have a continental grip? Yes. Do we bother with pancake grip? No. Yeah. <laughs> Good knee, Ben. He's got a good look outside. How similar is that? It's pretty cool. Yes. That's pretty cool. Our steps, I'm not going to go into the detail of the steps of the serve, but I'll, I'll tell them you tell show them to you real quick. Our first step is the tossing arm. We don't want the tossing arm going out. We want the tossing arm to come back to the inner hip. What is that doing? That's creating your shoulder pass hip turn. It's assuring me that this kid's turning. So we, this is called step one. What's our step two? Step two will be your tossing arm going up to release the ball, and that's when you're going to get to choose. If, you're, if we're asking to hit a kick serve, it stays further back. If it's a first serve, then it deviates. It comes from a little further out to put the ball in front. Okay? And then we ask him to separate this whole thing, guys. And I don't know how many of you remember this, but up together, down together, up together. It doesn't happen that way. Now it's up together if you want to, down together if you want to, but I need separation between this one going up and this one somewhat staying down because I want this. I want about 45 degrees on my shoulders. And when I go to hit, our step three has two parts. Part one, we have the loading here where the elbow is going to get exposed up to the sky. Part two is going to be the point of contact. How do we get to contact? Shoulder over shoulder. So I started with the shoulders at 45 degrees that are making impact. I want to reverse them. I want to be 45 degrees the other way. I was, oh, I thought you were rooting for me. Um, and then step four of the serve, it's about the land, landing. We're looking for them to land on the front leg with the back leg kind of kicking backwards, and we want the head up and looking at the other side of the court. And you can see it there. We're pretty good. If I was to get really demanding, I would ask him to possibly have the toss be a little bit higher so we don't see that, see that hunch that we have a little bit right there? That toss was a little bit low for him. He did not reach as high as he could. So he got pushed into it by the toss. Could you show it one more time? Yeah. Uh, go back and show it. I don't know if I can. Actually, yes. There you go. Hey, I figured it out. <laughs> So you're going to see a step one, tossing arm, comes to the inner thigh. Step two, separation of hands, tossing arm goes up. Oh, one more thing that's very important I forgot to tell you. On step two, when, they, when this hand goes up to toss, we're looking for this hand to not turn. So we want the palm looking at the ground. Okay? Any degree that you allow the players to go this way, you're starting to take meat away from the impact. That's number one. Number two, you're starting to create an over-excessive pronation. They're pronating from a deeper start point to the regular ending point of the pronation, and it will create injuries on the forearm and the bicep area because it's too stressful, it's too dramatic. It's like going from here to here instead of just going from here to here. Okay? Shoulders 45 degrees, shoulders reverse, impact, pronation, and coming across the body. Was that helpful? 
Again, and that's a ten and a half year old. He's been serving like that since he was probably eight. I've had him for about two and a half years. And it took us about five months since we got him to finally get the serve to be technically like that. Yes? You said the elbow up. We usually teach the elbow at shoulder height in that 45 position. You're saying up? No, when, when they go into what we call back scratch, yeah. if you look at it, elbow actually goes past that 45 degrees, but it's a little bit higher. I'll go back. Let's see if I can go back one more time. Does that elbow going up just give a fast acceleration coming through up going up top? I couldn't tell you about whether it's extreme more acceleration or not, but if that's what Mr. Federer is doing, that's what I want to get him to do. It's right there. Did you see what I mean? Yeah, you're talking about on the way up. Yes, on the way up. Oh, yes. Right. Okay. Yes. It's on the forward swing when we're addressing the ball. Yeah. Yes. Privately, one hour. Drills, about six. Yes. I just have one thing. You're talking about how you want his to toss higher. Well, if you look at Feds, Feds tosses right to the strike zone, and he's fully extended. Whereas the other, your young man, he's waiting for the ball, and it's coming down, and that's why. So you, okay, it might have been that. Yeah. Yeah. It might have been that he waited for the ball instead of going to the ball. <laughs> Rituals and routines. A lot of you have heard that we need to introduce kids to rituals and routines. But at what stage of development have you heard that? 12, 13, 14, 15, 16? Um, so let's not introduce him to any rituals and routines. And then all of a sudden, you've got to be disciplined about your game. You're going to have to warm up properly and stretch. And you're going to have to have certain things you do that is the same thing all the time because rituals and routines are good for you. Why wait? So I can tell you that at my place, every private lesson, every drill session starts with what you're going to see now. It's a ritual and a routine. It's a starting point. And when you see it now, this is a little bit faster than regular speed. I just want to play with it a little bit quicker. But you will see what they do. First, they have to complete two laps around one single tennis court. Then they have to do toe races all the way over, all the way back. Then they have to do what we call knee tucks, all the way over, all the way back. Then they have monster walk, all the way over, all the way back. Then they have lunges, all the way over, and all the way back. Then we're going to make him jog lightly from one side to the other and back pedal, and they have to do that twice. Then we ask him to shuffle. And they have to do that twice also. Then we have them do karaoke. And they have to do also that twice. <coughs> then they have to only cross over in front, which is a recovery step in tennis. And then they have to do only cross over behind. And they have to do each one of those twice. And that's the reason, if you noticed earlier, who noticed when all those kids were doing those four drills and those back and drills, they, they cross over on the first step. And they recover and they split step. Yes. We're starting to teach the mechanical aspect of what they're going to be doing, and then we teach things individually, but then we help them put them together, and immediately transfer into the content of play. How is it that this is going to be used when you're playing? The next one is tournament play. How often do your kids go out to play a tournament, and you call them on the phone, or they call you on the phone, and you go, how was your warm-up? That was great. Why'd you do? Walk in with Mary for five minutes. <laughs> they have tournament play, three tournament routines and rituals. What you're going to see now is they have to start short court. There's only four hands allowed, and they have to accumulate 20. Okay? What is the one I'm supposed to do? It's supposed to set up my ball control for the day so I can have an opportunity to hit about eight or ten optimal, amazing shots in a period of one match. But what happened to the other 200 shots they hit that day? Are they all supposed to be the optimal winners they're going to hit for 5 or 10? No. They're supposed to be balls that just simply go back and play. 
So the idea of the warm-up is to get them into a routine and a rhythm for the rest of the day. So you're going to see all the four is allowed, and they start short court. After they complete this short court, then they do it from the baseline. I will ask him to do 20 of those, and then he shifts over to backhands, and he would have to get 20 backhands just like that. And then they'll shift over to alternating, where he's going to have to alternate between forehand and backhand. Why do I ask for alternating? I want to stimulate it. foot movement. If you look at it, I'm only getting him to play on one service box. So I want him to have to get around the ball. Yes, sir? You ever make new slides around the service line? You want to see it in a second? Oh. Yes. <laughs> we introduce slides. We start getting the kids with slides by six, seven years old. We bring it up. Yes, on both sides. <coughs> Volleys. Now, this is the part that impressed me the most. When you watch this video now, tell me a 10-year-old that you know that will be able to get 24 in volleys consecutively, maintaining the integrity of the racket head without dropping, and being able to absorb the impact and the weight of the ball into the strings. They can do about four or five, and then everything dies. Yes, sir? Um, what do the kids do if there's not a warm-up course for before the match? If there's no warm-up court, they'll do their dynamic stretching. We've given suggestions for stuff they can do at the hotel, the elliptical machine, and the treadmill. We, the idea is to get them to break sweat if there's nothing available. Actually, I had to run around the parking lot doing crazy swings. I'm kidding. <laughs> but you've seen those, haven't you? Mm -hmm. So they have to do just 40 volleys. You have to complete 20. And then you have to do just back and volleys up to complete 20. And then you have to alternate. Actually, he'll go into random. So he doesn't know now what's coming. He has to get 20. And I'll say that, again, I don't think we find many. If we try to do this in a regular ball, we're going to find us doing this. Overhead, what are you noticing on the overhead? What side of the course are profiting from? Left. What size the player executed the shot to? Right. When he goes to play, why in the world would I want him to get the ball back to where it came from? So all we're doing is immediately going into a change of direction with the overhead so he gets used to hitting the ball away from what he hit the last one, which most likely is what we call open court. And they don't have to do it from the other side too. Each one of those will have to complete 20. Once they finish the overhead from there, and then we'll move back to the bay, to the green line, or to the 60-foot line, and then we'll have to do all forehands, all backhands, alternating. Everything you saw earlier that we did from the short court, with the exception of volleys. We also have them to serve. They have to complete 20 serves to each side. Why 20? My favorite number. That's a good number. <laughs> Tactics. Are we working already on things that these kids can do when they're playing? Yes. The first one we introduce them to is what we call, we've adopt, named the cross-court pattern. So you step on the court, you're playing an opponent that you don't know, you've never played it before. So we don't know what the strengths or the weaknesses are. Okay? On the 60-foot court, it's real easy. If you are Behind, anywhere you're standing, behind the service line, when you're making impact with the ball, you're going to simply hit everything cross-court. Unless it's the third consecutive of the same shot. If it's the third consecutive of the same shot, then you change direction. That makes sense? And that's what we call our cross-court pattern. If you get to the service line or inside of the cross-court pattern, then you're going to approach down the line and you're going to follow that to the net. And when you approach on the line, when the ball comes back, if it's above the net and you can attack it, you're going to volley cross court, sharp and shallow angles. You're not going to volley hard, deep back to the baseline. Mm -hmm. If it's below the net or you feel you cannot attack it, you're simply going to volley that ball deep back in front of you or to the center of the court. And you'll say, that's way too much for a 10 and under. It isn't. They can do it. If you simply explain it. The easiest way to get them to do it, actually bring them in and show them. Something that you put in footage that you let them see, they'll get it quicker. They're mostly visual. 
Second one, approach and volley to the open court. They don't create a connection. You have to explain it to them. When you approach, if you approach to that side of the court and you come to, to the net, if the ball's above the net, hit it away from the player. Don't hit it right back to the player. And you're going to see that we work on this on dead ball drills and we work this on live ball drills. Next one, overhead and volley to opposite location of the last shot. So you start getting them to think one shot ahead. How often do you see them get to an approach shot and on that approach shot that they have the ability to set up the point, they try to go for a winner and they miss it? Very often. Yeah. You'll be amazed once you tell them that there's a shot coming after this one. They don't try to do as much with the approach. They miss it less. They're more effective. And they actually continue to play as if the point will be going on. Instead of getting to a ball, hitting it, and assuming this has to be a winner and not following into play. Identify <coughs> mechanical or tactical weakness and create a that new pattern of play. All this video stuff that I'm showing you today, we do with them. So like I said to you, one of you guys earlier, I mentioned earlier that they know to look on a player on a warm-up, how do they take their racket back on the back end? And they know if they see this, bingo, I find a weakness. And what do they do if they see this? I want to get my point started. I want to serve or return to get myself at the point. Once the point gets started, by the third or fourth shot, I'm going to move that player to their forehand side, and whatever they give me, I'm going to see if I can go somewhat high heavy to their back inside, because if I do that, I'm going to create opportunities for myself. Inside out and inside in. Did you think I was going to be talking about inside out and inside in on tennis out there, orange ball tennis? Yeah, they do it. Not only do they do it, you're going to see when we go into the drills. Inside out and inside in is the way we start introducing them to open stands. Why do I want them doing an open stands with an inside out, inside in? Because out of the same look to you, we start hiding the shot. If I'm going to give these kids the best possible future in tennis with no limitations, I have to give them good technique, and I have to part of that good technique is their ability to hide shots. So if I sit up like this right here, and I decide to make contact with the ball here, where's my ball going to go? Well, I'm going inside out. But out of the same setup, I can just simply choose to open up a little bit earlier, make contact further in front, where am I going now? I'm going inside in. And we start telling them that. We don't wait until they're 16 until they go, oh, have you ever heard of an inside out, inside in? So don't set limitations on that they can do it. The last one is how to counter the inside out or the inside in. Often, you start seeing, like if you play one of the kids that I work with, don't try to play you to set up the inside out, inside in. <coughs> and often, they fall a victim of other players who develop that too. Well, how do you counter it? You go to the forehand. Yeah. The inside out, inside in needs the ball again on the back inside. And normally they go for the first one with the idea that you try to come right back to that back end to make it in a back end, and then they got you where they want you. Now they set up the meat shot what they're looking for. So what you do is my kids are taught that if that opponent, if you decide to play their back end, and that opponent hits around one back end, hits one inside out, one inside in, your very next shot goes to the forehand. You do not try to go back to the back end again. You move them to the forehand side, they hit a forehand, and then you go right back to the back end again. And all we do is we don't play into what players are trying to set up. And you could say that's extremely deep for 10 and under. That kid that won the Southern Close 10 and under this past year and dropped only two games, it's competition in the Southern section in 10 and under pretty high. Yes, we started this Orange Bowl thing about a year before the rest of the country started. So kids have been training and developing on this. For him to win that entire tournament only drop two games, and he dropped those two games in the final, it's a big deal. You know what he did in the finals? We identified the opponent had a weak backhand. We didn't even care about the fact that he had a weak backhand. We played the entire game for him to dictate what's for him, because he had switched to a one-hander backhand about three months before the tournament. And we switched to a one-hander backhand because he broke a finger on his left hand. So what do we do in the tournament? Well, the idea was for him to start the point and to go to the kid's forehand. 
to stimulate play to come to his forehand and wait for the opponent to try to hit to his backhand. And the moment that kid tried to hit to his backhand, run around it, go inside out. The kid had a bit of a weak grip on his backhand side. And then for the ball that came back from the inside out of that backhand, for him to look, to move forward, take the ball on the rise, approach to the kid's backhand, and then close out the point of the net with short angle balls or overheads. Executed that perfection. Two and up. Ran away with it. After the match, coach and the other kid came over and said, man, he played a great match, and I don't know how he did it. I was like, what do you mean I know that? I'm, I'm friends with, with Ronnie. I don't know, what do you mean you don't know how he did it? He said, he only hit seven backhands in the entire match. And I looked at Ronnie and I said, I'll teach you one day, I can't tell you yet. But he was able to dictate the entire match by dictating flight to come to his form by when he was locating his shots and having a plan. When's the last time you thought about talking to a 10-year-old and playing tennis with that much tactical perspective behind him? Never. I took a girl to five in the US and 11 ITF and 12 and under. Quarterfinals, Orange Bowl main draw, quarterfinals, any her main draw, semifinals or no super nationals in one particular year. You know what she did? Move on, get the ball play. There was no transition, there was no net play, there was no serve and tactical. None of this existed. So keep this in mind, those of you who are not quite believing on this yet, this is the future. Now we do need to come up, and I challenge the USDA to come up with something. We need a transitional phase from this orange ball to the regular ball, because that kid that beat that other kid in the finals 2 0, played that same kid three months later on a regular court. Lost to him 3 4, trying to beat him the same way he did in an orange ball. And the other kid simply went flat, 30 feet up in the air. And mine made 67 of force errors in a 3 and 4 match, trying to hit swinging balls out of the air. Yes, sir? Have you guys not started using the green dot balls yet? Mm, we're only using them on level 4, level 5 tournaments. That's our entry level tournaments. And they're using the green dot. The issue I have is this particular kid is already 37, he's between 37 and 39 in 12s already in his ranking. That's a level 3 and above tournament player already. Well, it's in Colorado. They're yep. making all mandatory 1200s green dot. And that's, I, I, we need to come up with something. I don't know exactly what the right solution will be, but something has to come into play because then it's not, I mean, I've been seeing this very strong progression in regards to expanding the player. And then looks on, I saw a huge regression when he had to go play the same kid three months later. Yeah. Although, and then what did I have to do? I had to go back and teach him how to get a, improve the quality of his high heavy ball to then create the short ball opportunities. And he's got it. He'll beat this kid next time probably two and one. His orange ball, the yellow balls. It's too big of a transition. <laughs> now, the purpose of the serve and the return, what do we teach him at this stage? Very simple. If you are behind the service line, we define the service line as the attack line. If you're behind the service line when you're returning serve, you start the point. If you can make it very close to the service line on side, it's like transition. You're attacking, you're following, and then you're dictating the point. Fact is, in a dead ball drill, and you're going to see here, this is a pretty much still a nine year old, this lantern. And you're going to see these are all dead ball feeding drills that we do with them. They'll start with forehands on the line, then backhands on the line, then forehand crossroad, then backhand crossroad, forehand inside out, backhand in, uh, back slice, forehand inside in, and then backhand slice cross court. And then we would normally do forehand slice cross court, forehand slice on the line. And in his case, he has to get 20, because of his skill level, he has to get 20 of each one of those, okay? And then if he, miss, if he misses more than three times before he gets his 20, he resets back to zero. That's okay. okay? What are you noticing that I do with numbers? Everything is to numbers. I'm a strong believer of that. Why? I think it goes along these lines. That that is measured will improve. So depending on the skill set of the player, first stage is to simply accumulate 20. Second stage, I give you a point, and then I deduct points from your total when you miss. Third phase of that is, let's say I'm trying to work on a little bit of an arch ball, so I may increase the amount of points they lose if they hit a ball in the net. 
So if they miss, they might lose one point. If they miss in the net, they might lose three or five. And then it goes into, if you miss more than three or four, then you go back to zero, you reset. And then we get to the point where I was working with one of the, guy, one of the girls that played for USC this past year, this summer. And with her at that level, um, no, you got three chances to get 20 in a row. If you don't get 20 in a row within three chances, what do I say then? Keep in mind, this is a 19-year-old that's a very good, should probably play somewhere between four or five this year for USC, which is, I think, preseason four in the country. In the so what do you think I told you? You get three chances to get 20 in a row. If you don't do it, what do I do? You make a run after she doesn't do it. No, I don't make a run. No, I don't send her home. If you didn't get it, you're going to have to go home, and you're going to have to deal with the fact that you failed. And I move on to the next one. So we start introducing the fact that you're not going to do everything. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to miss. Deal with it. Because you've got another 120 to come. You've got a chance now. So let's watch him execute the drills. And he would have to hit, in this case, it would be 20 just like that, down the line with the forehead. He's and he would have to then go margin. with the back end. We would have to go down the line with the back end. He would have to do his 20. You can start seeing crossover steps, split steps. And then you have to go cross court. <laughs> Cross forward the back end. Why do you think I came up with that? You miss more than three, lose your points. I had an issue with this kid paying attention during match matches. He used to start matches and he, he would drift off. Here's your open stance, going inside out. And he just fooled you because you thought he was going to go inside out again. So at nine, just turn 10. We're starting to loosen that, and there's your back and slice down the line. Now we're moving back to the baseline. Now he's going to have to go side to side. Now on the next set of drills that we do, once we start adding and combining balls to possibly both sides, the first time we do it, it's predictable. So you'll know that he's going from a forehand, recovery split to a backhand. Okay. The next evolution of that, it's random. So he will not know whether we're going to give him a forward or a back or next. I'm only going to show predictable here. I didn't show you random, but now you understand what, what the idea is. And we start getting close to involving your, I don't know how many of you have heard that USTA said it yet, but it's eyes, mind, and feet. And then in my case, eventually the hands. But your eyes is the first thing that activates then your brain has to recognize. Now you see him, he's going cross forward, and he's going to go inside out. And I believe now we go cross forward, and then he has to go inside in. Another thing we do with them is if we're doing the feeding, we don't do the feeding from the same location all the time. So I could do that drill one day with me feeding from the center of the court. I can do the next time I can do it with me feeding from the do side. Next time from the out side. So have the perspective in your mind that when he's going cross court with a forehand of a ball coming from cross court, and he's going cross court with a forehand with a ball coming from the out side, it's, a, it's almost a completely different shot. It's not the same shot. Because the incoming ball is different. So the idea is to train them as close as possible to how this is going to transfer into competitive play. Oh, Mr. I can come in a moment. Again, when we have regular balls and we train 10 or 9 on regular balls, then we all do drills like drills like this one. Yes? Some of you did. I had a big argument with Chuck Crazy on a phone conversation. Um, because he says that he believes on the orange ball for training purposes, but he doesn't believe on the orange ball for competitive purposes. Okay, so what's the point of me doing something in a controlled environment for the next three years to then finally then take it to an open environment three years later? Why not do it already? 
if they can start coming in like this already with their plane, why train them with a regular ball to do this drill, but then how often would you see them do this when they were playing with a regular quote with a regular ball? No, it wouldn't happen. Well, pro split step and volley, if you notice, what grip is using for the volley? Continental. Yes. How many hands on the back of the volley? One. One. Yes. <coughs> that girl that I told you about USC? Two-handed back volley. Oh, she was about 17, she had a two-handed back and volley. She was top 15 in the country. You know how I was able to convince her to switch to a one-hander? I said, college coaches are going to go look at you. They're trying to recruit you. They're going to see you hitting that thing, and it doesn't matter if you make all of them. They're going to think you're goofy looking. <laughs> yeah. But I had to wait until 17 to get her to change it. She, she refused to do it until then. Now we go into live on. So we start talking about tactics on live ball work. Here's your approach and ball to the open court drill. And again, look at the depth of the player in regards to the movement, understanding the ball is hitting, where the location is. <coughs> look at the stab, one hand, the back and ball, that would have been for a drop shot win or a cross court pass. We have him in this case, he'll approach, you'll see him now off top spin balls. Then that just looked like fair, regards to the volley. And then off slide balls. It's a high back and volley for a 10 year old. There's females on tour who still can't hit that shot. <laughs> now you're going to get the view from the back. And I'm letting you see a lot of this because I think this is the biggest thing that this is allowing us to do. These kids are being able to develop all around. The ages of the one-dimensional player being a world-class player are gone. And again, my presentation is not about you getting 30 kids on a court and let's play tennis. This is about you developing a quality tennis player. Now, is this a quality tennis player? I told you how many hours of progress it takes a week? One. One. Six um, probably ranging this past year, they decided to go homeschooling. So he's, uh, he's doing maybe about probably 15 to 20. Now we switch into pattern of play. This one you're going to see now is your cross court pattern. So we're playing the cross court pattern with the change of direction. So the opponent is coming back twice, and then he's changing direction and going down the line. And there's your change of direction of the third consecutive ball to the same side. Here's with the back end. You'll see a third consecutive ball to the same side. He changes direction, he goes down the line. <coughs> now we got it that the opponent changed direction first. So the opponent, I believe, is going to go down the line, and then he goes cross court. And right there, you and I know he would have taken control at that point. Opponent's on the run. And now we do it the other way. So these are all drills we do. And for example, when he completes his third shot right there, he would have got one point. And he would have to give that to, say, 10, 20, whatever amount of points I said. Now I believe he's going inside out. Yes, so he had to go twice, went twice back cross court. Ball came back, he got around and went inside out. And now he goes, ball comes back, he goes inside in. This one started getting more complicated. Ball came back a third time, takes it on the rise, comes in and ball is to the open court. Touch, drop ball, 10. And the other way around, out of a top spin, so he approaches, comes in, again, touch, feeling, drop ball, 10 years old. 
Now we make him do it coming in out of a slice. And it's a little bit uncomfortable because it's a high ball. We slice and it, sneak him in, and then put it in the back and ball. The last one is what we call middle of the court. So he went cross court. The player comes back cross court. He goes down the line. The player breaks down, leaves the ball short, and he sets up with an open stance on a short ball and then goes inside out. And then he'll do it opponent on the other play, the other side of the direction. He'll go down the line now, ball comes back again, it's a sitter in the middle of the court, open stance, and he goes inside in. How often do you see this on TV? Yes. All the time. That's what the guys are doing. Emotional impairment. A-F-R-S. You're going to teach your players to accept that they're going to make mistakes. They have to forgive themselves for making that mistake. They have to take time to recognize what happened. Why did I make that mistake? And they have to then give themselves a suggestion of how to fix that mistake. Two things for sure in life. We all will die. And the second one, you will miss in tennis. <laughs> so we teach them that from the very end, you're going to win if you make less mistakes. You will lose if you make more mistakes. It's not a game of being better or looking prettier. It's a game of who is most understandable of what are my limitations and what is it I can and cannot do. The process, not the outcome. Start teaching them to respect their effort. They're all too often. How did you play? Horrible. Why? You lost. Maybe they played the best match of their life. So if you teach them to respect their effort and not just simply give value to their outcome, you're going to have what I call free tennis. They get on the court, they come up with a plan, they do the best they can. If they win, they're proud. If they lose, they're equally proud. Parents, do not push them away. Educate them. They are the ones who watch them, they are the ones who spend time with them, and they are the ones who pay the bill. Take the time to educate them, they kind of become a little bit more friendly to you. So include them. Don't push them out of the process. Communicate with them. I know it's difficult, but it is in your best interest. Be patient with the parents. They don't get it. Understand their insecurities. I mean, they are left to be the executives who are making all the choices of what happens with their kids' tennis. Are they experts? No. Do they get exposed to 500 experts every weekend? Yes. Who are those 500 experts? The other parents of the tournament who know just as much or less than they do. So be patient when they come back at you with all crazy, all kinds of crazy ideas after the tournament. <laughs> Don't fall in the trap. There are professional relationships. There are personal relationships. You're going to find a lot of these parents will try to trap you into converting a professional relationship into a personal relationship in order to get more out of you for a deal. Yeah. <laughs> and when you fall into that and you let those lines blur, the day that they're not getting from you what they want, what happens? Success doesn't equal security. Even though you're successful, you will still get fired. I can tell you, I took a girl from 91 in the country to number 5 and 11 in the world in 10 months. I got fired after 10 months. I took a girl from mid-140s to 21 in the country in one year. I got fired. And recently, I took a girl from 31 or 33 in the section to number 1 in the south in the tents. And I got fired. You know, in all three situations, why I got fired? The parents have created their own professional ideas what needed to be done with the kid. I didn't agree. I wouldn't do it. They went, they went somewhere else. They went to the guy that said, oh, yeah, we'll do that. No problem. And that's fine. I maintained it as a professional relationship. They didn't get attached, and I'm good. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, on the back hand, two hand back, what kind of grip do you like to have on that bottom hand? 
on them or past that? On the bottom end, I'm, I'm between a, uh, between a continental and eastern. You never see girls more on the eastern side. Boys are really tend to get into the continental. Although, it's, keep in mind, the, the evolution of the women's game is going to be similar to the men's. I believe you're going to start seeing more angular in the women's instead of so linear. So I think the future of even a woman tennis is going to be closer to a continental so they can handle higher ball. A lot of men, you'll see on the pro, a lot of them slice the, you know, they got a great tube, they can slice, but a lot of women never slice at all. Yeah. Any other question? Yes, sir. Where, where can we find those uh, videos that you guys showed up? Uh, those are mine, man. I made those myself. <laughs> But that, that's a good point because I, I, you gave me stimulus. I think that I should put something like this and have it available that people can go online and take a look at it. Thank you. I thank you. Any other question? If you have any questions, anything comes to mind on the table right by the I exit, there's my business card. Feel free to grab one, contact me. I'll be more than happy to consider your help. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it.